Greetings, mortals. Welcome to Fatal Fortunes. I'm Al. I'm Will. Join us for a deep dive into some of history's most fascinating characters who live dangerously beautiful lives and whose legacies haunt us today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fatal Fortunes. How's everyone doing today? Hi, the only person here. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are so excited to bring part two of Princess Margaret's story to you. Um, if you haven't seen our first episode already, make sure to check it out. And yeah, we're so excited to continue and come to a conclusion on Princess Margaret's life, if we ever can come to a conclusion. I know, we've spent so much time with her. <laughs> I'm sad to leave her, but all <laughs> but good we things must, we must, must come to an end. <laughs> Let's go back to 1955. 1955, this was a year of modernization, exploration, invention, fun, glamour, social change. So we have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. leading the Montgomery bus boycott. And wait, was that the bus boycott? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. So we have Dr. So we have Dr. Martin Luther King leading the Montgomery boycott with the buses and 15 year old Claudette Colvin refuses to move from her bus seat. Prime Minister Winston Churchill resigns and Anthony Eden, first Earl of Avon, becomes prime minister. The polio vaccine is approved by the FDA one of the most notable books, Lolita by Vladimir Nobokov, was released, which at that time, I imagine, was very controversial because it still is such a controversial book. Disneyland opens in Anaheim, California. Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, the whole gang. They're all Your there. Your backyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OC represent. <laughs> and the world population is just over 2 billion. So it's a pretty big year. There's a lot of change. And this is the time that we're going to drop you into history with Princess Margaret. This is where we're picking back up. So before we go back to Margaret, let's talk about what we're drinking today. So guys, little story. I got some dental stuff done yesterday. And in the little pamphlet, it said, don't drink anything with citrus. I've been seeing Will on Instagram having some citrus and tequila every night <laughs> researching our next episode. So I said, okay, I'm going to do that over dinner. And then I'm like, why are my teeth on fire? And then I remember the little <laughs> pamphlet said, the last thing you should do is have citrus right now. So yeah, I have means- switched from tequila to Earl Grey in my Lexus Nexus cup and Odds nice. are I don't even take a sip of it this whole episode because it's so hot right now. <laughs> and I, I want to take the lid off, but I'm yeah. afraid it's going to spill all over my laptop. Yeah, you know, no no pressure to hurt your teeth. You can wait. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I also am drinking a non-alcoholic beverage. I'm drinking coffee just because I was traveling today safely, hopefully, like, I mean, as safe as you can these days and I'm going to get tested later this week. Um, I'm back in LA was visiting family for the holidays for over a month. Um, And now I'm drinking some coffee with some almond milk from this. This is actually a really interesting. um, Oh, I forgot the name of the brand. I think it's like abalone or something coffee, but it's these, it's a total LA cliche. It's this group of friends in Topanga which I don't know if you know where Topanga is. It's like the I know where, like north, right? Yeah, it's like the it's like going into Malibu. You go through Topanga. It's like very like in nature, gotcha. peace, <laughs> yoga, uh, adaptogens, ashwagandha. You know, Topanga. Yeah, exactly. And it, apparently, a group of friends just sat around a campfire or something, and like we're gonna make this coffee. And what's our idea? What's our idea? Coffee. <laughs> yeah. So I like that it has a story behind it. So, and it's pretty good. So that's what we're drinking. (laughs) Yeah, we're drinking caffeine tonight, not alcohol. It's yeah. Never feel pressure like during our podcast that you have because you know we love to you know have our cocktail a day. The cocktail doesn't have to have any alcohol in it. It could be whatever you want. It could be a glass of water. It's what you want to 
indulge in as you're indulging in this podcast. Guide you through your hour with Alan Will. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's dive right into Margaret. So like Will said, it's 1955 where we're picking up with her story. And what's Margaret doing after her big breakup? Margaret is diving deep into alcohol. She's kind of doing it as she because she's depressed, let's be honest. And people around her age, they're starting to get married and they're starting to start families. So she's decided she's just going to marry someone she likes, not someone she loves. She's not hung up on love anymore. And she decides that she's going to marry this guy named Billy Wallace. They get engaged. His father is the minister of transport and he thinks that he has Margaret just wrapped around his little finger so he goes off to bermuda right before they're going to announce their engagement and he has a fling he goes back he's so bold he's like yeah margaret just went to bermuda and i cheated on you and she's like okay bye Mm -hmm. which is totally not the reaction he thought he was gonna get he thought that margaret was just gonna be like okay and the engagement's getting announced on thursday but that is not how history ended up (laughs) <laughs> they end up breaking off their engagement in 1956. So a short little fling. A short little fling, indeed. So after Billy Wallace, there comes Armstrong Jones. Now, who is Anthony Armstrong Jones, commonly known as Tony? So Tony was the only son from the marriage of the barrister Ronald Armstrong Jones and his first wife, Anne Messel, who later becomes Countess of Ross. He was born at Eaton Terrace, Belgravia in London, and his parents divorced when he's five and his mother goes on to have children by her second husband. He catches polio as a child at a time where kids were dying from the disease at a noticeable rate. This sparks his lifelong passion for helping the disabled, and you'll even see Tony later in his life going to Aberven, the mining village, and helping the children there. So really the start of his lifelong passion for helping the disabled because it's kind of a part of him. It's a part of his childhood having polio. And so he mostly shuffled around boarding schools when he was younger for education. And he eventually lands at Eton. From there, he goes to Cambridge U, but he fails his second year exams and drops out to become not, you know, a scientist or a doctor. He becomes a photographer. That's his passion. And I really respect that <laughs> when someone that sounds like you... many an Emersonian to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mean I kind of respect it like when you when everyone else is expecting you to just do education, but you're like, no, I just want to do my passion. Like, you know, go for it. So he is really swinging the 60s before the 60s even start. So he's all about free love and just, you know, art and just carefree you know, fun. And photos actually later surface of him in the 50s while he's in drag, which I think is really amazing. Um, And he even starts dating two other women before he meets Margaret. So there's Jackie And while he's dating Margaret. That's true. Yeah, he, you know, from an early age, he's a player. Like, I don't think he ever stopped being a player. He just, he could never settle for just one. He needed multiple love interactions, transactions in his life. So after the sad end of her relationship with Captain Peter Townsend, the young Princess Margaret was one of the most desirable single women in England. As royal biographer and de Courcy explains in her biography of Tony, the young royal Princess Margaret was a unique and intoxicating challenge for the famous photographer Tony and he really becomes this sort of society photographer going to all these you know galas and parties weddings you know photographing photographing the elite of the United Kingdom and he's getting those candid photos those like slightly off-kiltered photos so it's edgy for a time when people are like how do we be edgy yeah he's not so much you know the Cecil B. in who was you know the early well, he he wasn't really the Cecil Beaton who Cecil Beaton, if you don't know, he's this royal photographer who really sets up the portraits and like is very specific to everything. Really f- fantastic, remarkable photos. But I would say Tony is a little bit more like in the moment, you know, he's looking yeah. for those like 
He's not posing the photos so much as like even people said that when Tony was photographing them, you wouldn't even notice that he'd taken a picture because he was just right. chatting you up and so charismatic and stuff like that. Yep. And when they first meet at a dinner party in 1958, it doesn't take Margaret and Tony to hit it off. However, a few months later, Tony is commissioned to photograph Margaret the queen's sister and that really starts their kind of secret love affair meeting at his studio you know it's very sort of steamy and salacious and i remember i forget who said this maybe it was ann glenn connor but she said that after that dinner party that they meet at in 1958 someone asked like oh what do you think of tony she's like ah he's probably gay nobody knew about their relationship there wasn't even a whisper about it Margaret would see Tony in secret at his studio and he would join her at parties, but no one would really pinpoint that he was the one that she was interested in. The press would focus more on people who were seen as eligible because, you know, he was a photographer. He wasn't doing something that was deemed noble or esteemed by society, especially royal society. Oh, and that noble esteem thing from society would be to not work at all. Like she's not dating some landed gentry guy whose only job is to make sure that the checks cash on the first like Mm. especially because tony doesn't have the pedigree either so they're more looking at like marquis of blank like i said in the last episode of duke of blah 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 like i said previously they're not looking for tony the guy who's five foot three a photographer didn't finish cambridge barely got to eat in first child of someone who is a countess but he's not he doesn't have a title so The press aren't picking him. Princess Margaret wanted to show the public that she had moved on from Townsend. And on February 26, 1960, her engagement to her new love interest was announced quick on the heels of her ex's remarriage. The news came as a surprise to many, and it didn't go over well with everyone, particularly royal courtiers, who would have preferred Margaret marry a wealthy aristocrat or a foreign prince. The royal family were delighted that she's finally getting married because it's basically at the point where she's about to get put on the shelf. They like him very much. Tony had great charm, very good manners, and he knew exactly how to behave, de Courcy explained. He felt a devotion to the royal family, to the queen who he admired immensely. He got on very well with Prince Charles, and he adored the queen mother. So it's a really quick introduction into the family, but the family seems to like him. Because they're like, it's really just better than no one at all. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And he is very charismatic, you know, so he's able to work well in the crowds and with people. So, yeah. He's a good representative of the state. He does have some aristocracy in his family. So, you know, he's able to eligibly marry Princess Margaret. And I think that because he has that aristocratic background but he's not like a part of the fold i think that that's what makes him even more want to fit in and even more want to be accepted by the queen the queen mother prince charles etc because he i think he feels as some sort of entitlement to the privileges of the upper class because he can like see it and he's seen it for his whole childhood but he can't just grasp it so in a weird way to show his mom like oh you can become countess of ross like i can become i can marry a princess of the united kingdom Mm -hmm. like his goal is kind of one-upping her So after Margaret's first unhappy love affair, the queen, her sister, wanted to be happy. Or wait, sorry. After Margaret's first unhappy love affair, Queen Elizabeth wanted her sister to be happy. And the public, they were actually pretty pleased to know that Margaret could settle down with this new guy, Tony. And they were actually pretty supportive. On May 6, 1960, the couple becomes the first royal marriage to be broadcast on television. So that's a pretty big deal because the royal wedding is really a huge phenomenon now. And this is the first time we're getting that sort of modern push for the royal family to become more of the media and, you know, have more of a spectacle that everyone, commoners can... Yeah, they're letting us into the pageantry. Right, exactly. Yeah. taking. And another note on that, if you want to watch the video of Princess Margaret's wedding, it's on YouTube and the curtsy she takes for her sister is so deep she might as well have touched her ass to the ground (laughs) 
Wow, I, I didn't think know that, that was really cool. No, t- definitely take a look. I recommend everyone take a look because it's so mm-hmm. mesmerizing. To be honest, it's like wow, I did not so- know someone could get down on the ground that gracefully and get back up again on TV in front of like oh. sixty million people. Yeah, you know they they do have their issues from time to time, like every sibling pair does, but they do really love each other, and I love Margaret and Elizabeth through relationship. I think it's really cool. She looked really beautiful in her wedding day, too, I must say. Really amazing. Which I was kind of surprised. I'm surprised that she wore a long sleeve, long gown, especially because she's so known for that cleavage in the 50s. Like, what do you right. think? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm not too surprised just because I think with royal protocol, you can't really go to, you can't show much Catherine's skin. Catherine's wedding like. dress looks a lot like margaret yeah like the long no, that's sleeve, true neck i mean like the waist is definitely a little bit different but i think that they're the most similar for all wedding dresses i cannot contain myself because there is an enormous scandal that happens while tony and margaret are away on their hunting room hunting room honeymoon there is a huge scandal while tony and margaret are away on their honeymoon Tony's former lover, Camilla Fry, gives birth to their daughter, Polly Fry, three weeks later on May 28th, 1960. Ooh, ooh. Ooh. Polly Fry. That's such an interesting name, too. What does that remind you of? It's like... I don't know, kind of like the oven fry stuff that you can, like, coat chicken in. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. After the return from a six-week honeymoon aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia, the newlyweds Margaret and Tony move into Kensington Palace in London. So Anthony Armstrong Jones, he's given the title Earl of Snowden, and in 1961, they welcomed their first child, David, at Clarence House. Clarence House is a place where a bunch of royals live, couples and their families. It's really kind of a family house, I would say. Their daughter, Sarah, was born three years later, and that was just a really happy time in their relationship, the early years. (laughs) Yes, this was definitely the peak of their relationship, and I think that this is a perfect time to segue into Margaret and Tony's children. So, her first child, David, is a carpenter and former chairman of Christie's Auction House. So whenever you see in the news, like sometimes like royal reporters and stuff, they'll be like, He's just a carpenter. And it's like, he's a carpenter and he's the chairman of Christie's Auction House. Mm -hmm. He's not broke. He's not broke like a regular carpenter would be. Anyhow, he was a classmate of Prince Andrew in Buckingham Palace because he's only a year older. After he went to a lot of schools, eventually finishing nowhere I've ever heard of, he married the Honorable Serena Stanhope in 1993, whose father is an earl. They have two children, Charles and Margareta. Charles is the heir to the earldom, and he studies something boring at a university that's too hard to pronounce. Margareta mm-hmm. makes jewelry, and she was a bridesmaid at Kate and William's wedding in 2011. He took part in the Vigil of the Princes in 2002 when the Queen Mum died. The only other time that the Vigil of the Princes has happened before was in 1936 when King George V had died. So that's his one claim to fame, basically. Two guys went to prison for blackmailing him in 2005 after showing a video to an undercover cop of an alleged cocaine use and sex acts between him and a male aide, the perps got five-year sentences, and he and his wife announced their plans to divorce in 2020. That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. The the aristocracy's naughty. It is naughty, and I didn't really hear about that until you, you know, told me that. And um, I think that. But they don't want people to know. I bet they're like, it was fifteen years ago. Yeah, and, and I sentences and I think, have been served. And I think David's scandal with the cocaine and the gay sex acts. I, I think they would have definitely. It would have been blown out way more if he was, you know, Elizabeth's child, because you know. Oh yeah. The, the direct air, the sovereign's line, direct line, that's always going to get more attention than the others. <laughs> yeah, like if he was in Prince Andrew's shoes, this would have never gone away. But it took a little bit of digging for me to find out about this. Wow. 
Anyway, he only has one full sister, and her name is Sarah. Sarah is a painter, and she was born three years after her brother in 1964 in Kensington Palace. She is actually a godmother to Prince Harry and Lady Louise Windsor, who's another grandchild of the Queen. She's a country girl like her mom, and she loves um, to paint. It was fostered by the landscapes at Balmoral Castle. She was a bridesmaid at Prince Charles and Diana's wedding in 1981. And in 1984, she was on set with her dad, who was a photographer on this movie called Passage to India, where she meets Daniel Chato, whose name at the time they meet is Daniel St. George Chato Sproul, which is a variation of spelling on my last name. And there are more black bears in Massachusetts than mm-hmm. there are Sprouls in the entire world. So I think that that's very cool. Not saying I'm not claiming anything, but I think that's pretty cool. They marry in 1994 with Zara Tyndall as a bridesmaid. They have two children, Samuel and Art. Samuel is a potter and Art is, does sports, lifts things, gets watch sponsorships. Nice. He was also a page of honor to the queen. So I also remember seeing in a documentary one time that the kids ended up seeing, Sarah and David ended up seeing the queen more during the summer than Margaret because Margaret would spend basically all of summer in Mystique, so they would go and be with the Queen in Balmoral, and they were like, hmm, it's kind of crazy that our aunt, the Queen's, were present than our mom, not the Queen. Hmm, oh, that's sad. But what do you think? Are the kids all right? I think they're all right. I mean, I, I think, well, <laughs> they're all right for being, well, maybe they aren't all right. I'll take that back. I don't think it's, possible for the royal children to have a normal childhood obviously and you know there's definitely a lack at least back then there was a big lack of parental guidance you know even from queen elizabeth's children um you know i mean you 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 can still have a close connection but you might not see them as often because your parents are on a tour across a different country or you know they're going to the united states to meet with a president or they're just going around the the united kingdom and you know doing all these sort of acts of pleasantries and ribbon or cutting they're on ceremonies four months of the year or they're yeah like, or they're just vacationing <laughs> you like, oh you have a geometry test but i'm going to fucking switzerland yeah <laughs> and I think you can kind of see a difference with William and Harry because they just seem like they're such big family people. And I they mean, seem like they go to the recitals. Yeah, because I think th- they are kind of knowledgeable about being honest about the plights of the monarchy on the family system. And I think they're trying to sort of combat the negative stigmas and oppressive elements of it that it has on you know the family and i feel like people think of like a lot of family moments of like meals together i can only imagine what it's like to like your mom don't cook like not only does your mom not cook she's never cooked like she presses a button and it shows up (laughs) on a tray yeah so i can only imagine what it's like to like have that disconnect like you're not like doing a common task together ever really unless you're like riding horses I'm going to be honest, I cannot, I, I cannot see Margaret cooking, like, a decent meal. I, I feel like there would be a lot of smoke. <laughs> oh, I feel like she can't even boil pasta. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't think the kids are all right. I think no, that some of that don't. is... Um, I think there's really crazy shit happening behind those doors, especially since David's getting a divorce this year. Hmm, Yeah. Dang. After 27 years of marriage. Yeah, this is juicy. Come on, Peter Morgan, the creator of The Crown, if you're listening, can you consider going up to present day? Because I would love to see David's story with the cocaine and sex acts. Do you think that Netflix. he would be able to sue Peter Morgan for like malicious liable if that stuff's not true? Like, for like, I mean, it has to be true if someone went to prison for it. Yeah. If, no, I, I don't think he could sue because it's public record. It's, you know, been reported yeah. by other people. It's all news. and He's just, and, like, not in the royal family. Right. And, and the crown, as we say on the show, it's fiction It's fiction. It's fun. <laughs> it's fiction. It's fiction adjacent. Yeah. 
fun fiction adjacent. Perfect. That's yeah. what the crown is. Lots of truth in there, but you know, embellishments, of course, and rumors. I know. Give me theta. Like, don't just make it an undercover cop story. Like, give me theta, drama, fill in the blanks for me, Peter Morgan. We need to know. Yeah, exactly. Royal biographer Anda Corsi, she says that the first few years for Margaret and Tony, they're wonderful. You know, they had a lot in common. They both, you know, kind of have these feisty, you know, fun, playful personalities. Um, He would help her with her speeches. And they were just very close and kind of, you know, partners, I would say. Um, But they might have been a little too close for comfort because they both enjoyed the celebrity lifestyle. They had the desire to be center stage and that said to have, you know, caused some tension between the two soon after the birth of their daughter. So like Al said, the birth of Sarah is, it's kind of the peak of their relationship. 1965, Tony and Margaret travel to the United States. They meet up with their really good friend, Charmin Douglas. We talked about them a little bit last episode. And they also meet President Lyndon B. Johnson. And they give him the royal knight treatment. And in the crown, I remember there was that scene where Margaret and Johnson are like playing on the piano, singing songs and... Telling limericks. Yeah. I bet they had fun with Margaret. You know, she's... To be honest, I mean, I don't think this is debated that often but i think margaret had a lot more fun than queen elizabeth especially with you know these international meetings and royal engagements we just have to remember though the queen's a different person behind closed doors apparently when like the cameras aren't rolling and people aren't there the queen's mimicking every single person she met that that day like at the dinner table she's cracking jokes yeah and margaret doesn't have to carry sort of the weight of the nation and the commonwealth on her shoulders and the monarchy, you know, she doesn't have that yeah. pressure as much. So, you know, she can kind of let, let loose and have some fun. Before we get to the downfall of the marriage, Will and I have something so important to tell you. We have started a Patreon page. So for just $3 a month, you can get early access to all of our upcoming videos. And if you join higher up tiers, you can get an exclusive sticker or tote bag designed by my best friend Uma Dasso Tool, and it's also the little logo that you see all over the place for us. It would mean so much if you supported us. There's five, six tiers that you can be a part of, and you can even make fan requests at the highest tier. We'll send you a personal card. There are per- live Q&As that we're going to do with our patrons, so there's a lot that you can do. For yeah. sure. Please join us on Patreon. We're so excited to have you there. Yes, and you can find us at patreon.com slash fatal fortunes podcast. Yay, so exciting. Yes, we really want to just, you know, create this community. And we know that there's so many other people out there like us that are obsessed with these fascinating stories of, you know, people who had tragedy, mystery, beauty, drama, you know, amazing um, events in their lives. And we're just so excited to bring you this podcast and to really develop a deeper community on Patreon. So please check it out. According to the Evening Standard, Snowden started having casual flings while he was away on photographic assignments, while Margaret had a brief relationship with Snowden's university friend, Anthony Barton, and later Roddy Llewellyn, a landscape gardener, 18 years her junior... In 1969, Snowden embarked on an extramarital affair with Lady Jacqueline Rufus Isaacs, which, despite her own infidelities, greatly upset Margaret. In the same year, he was also the creative director of Charles's Investiture as the Prince of Wales, which I found out isn't just because he's a royal, it's because in the House of Lords, he was the person who was in charge of like the management of Carnarvon Castle, where they have the investiture. So he was mm-hmm. in charge of like planning general cultural events for that. Oh, I didn't. So know it's that. not like it's not like the Queen like said, "Screw you, Lord Litchfield. Screw, screw you, Cecil Beaton. Like screw every photographer. I'm picking my brother-in-law." It actually makes sense that this is the job he got. Wow. Yeah, and that must have been sort of troublesome for Margaret because. Here you have your family, you know, even though, like you said, it wasn't all, you know, the royal family, Princess Elizabeth, or 
Queen Elizabeth, you know, putting him in that role, but they were supporting him in that role. And Prince Charles investiture is a huge event because he's, you know, the future king of the United Kingdom, him becoming the Prince of Wales and Tony organizing, you know, creative directing that event while he's screwing around with other women, Lady Jacqueline, Rufus, Isaacs, and Margaret's upset. So, so it's like, you know, oh, I brought you into this family and you're doing this to me. And now you're, you know, doing something that I kind of gave to you and you're taking from me, you know? It, it's kind yeah. of that power dynamic that I think we see in Margaret and Tony's relationship. It's always kind of fluctuating with the Because they both really want to be in control. Yeah, for sure. So their marriage became pretty toxic and a lot of it came from Tony's abusive behavior and manipulative mind games with Margaret. He would leave little notes around for Margaret to find. Uh, There was one allegedly that said, you look like a Jewish manicurist. And then there was one that just said, I hate you. Just the simple three letter. (laughs) I hate you. And he also spied on Margaret with, a peephole which i think is really crazy and creepy like never want to hang out with her but i want to spy on her like how weird is that yeah that's really kind of serial killer territory yeah that's leave him behavior definitely yeah no one ever don't you ever spy on someone with the peephole i don't Don't care if you settle for that don't you settle yeah (laughs) yeah that is not okay that's a red flag and the reddest flag, literally yeah. like a black flag with a skull on it, is that. Yeah. And just so you know, these three facts, or these, I, yeah, they are facts because, well, I believe them to be facts because these are actually reported um, as occurrences by Princess Margaret's friends and confidants. So, you, you know, this isn't just like speculation, like this is some real royal mess. In 1974, Princess Margaret takes a heavy dose of sleeping pills. According to the princess biographer Christopher Warwick, Margaret was dealing with an explosive separation from Tony. This was after Roddy Llewellyn had flown off on a trip to clear his head after the public learned about his relationship with Princess Margaret. So according to Warwick, it wasn't a suicide attempt, but just Margaret wanting to, you know, relax, sleep, kind of take the pressure and stress off of her um, and have some, you know, reprieve from her life that became so sort of overwhelming and toxic and just not healthy for anyone to be experiencing. According to Warwick further, Tony still wanted to have a go at Margaret after the sleeping pill incident. Even though she was so stressed and she was just trying to rest, he tries to get past two of her ladies in waiting. And they say, no, Tony, you're not going in. She needs to rest. So instead, he goes out, he gets into his car and starts playing the car horn as loud as possible, driving around, like revving the engine, just to... It just indicates the kind of stress that, like, the marriage and put on Margaret and how much they're really resenting each other at this time. And, like, they're already separated, so he shouldn't even necessarily be in the house. Like, why is he trying to force something that's clearly not there? It's because he sucks. It's because he's terrible. He sucks. He's a womanizer. He's a cheat. Yeah. He's self-centered. He doesn't care about anyone else's thoughts or feelings. So this seems exactly like something you would do. Like, oh, the second Margaret's incapacitated, I need her to serve me again. So because she can't, I'm going to make it impossible for her to rest and make her want to take even more sleeping pills. Uh, I know. (laughs) He honestly, okay, not, I remember I brought Scott, Lord Scott Disick into this (laughs) last episode comparing his relationship with the younger woman to Peter Townsend but it kind of reminds me of Scott Disick like how he kind of like after he was cheating on Courtney after he you know was doing really messed up things like stuffing a dollar into the waiter's oh yeah the hundred dollar bill in the waiter's mouth oh my god those are the best seasons of the show though the best seasons was there was Scott drama like do you remember that dinner where they're on like the seasonal family vacay Mm. and the whole dinner is them just yelling at fucking Scott (laughs) Yeah. 
Like that was the last time to me that show was good. I think it was like six seasons ago. Wait, was that the one where they all like throw water in his face? Yes. Or yes. Mila, whatever it is. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of Tony a little bit. Like he he knows he's doing something wrong and he keeps on doing it to kind of anger people and to kind of egg on and to kind of provoke them. I think that is definitely something that Tony likes to do is provoke Margaret. And you know, Margaret, she, she would provoke him too, but I want to say to the level that Tony's doing it with, you know, after she possibly committed or tried to commit suicide, he's just, you know, causing her this, unbelievable stress by revving around the engine and the interesting parallel to like the scott disick parable is that the kardashians are standing up for courtney but the royal family they're like no we're just gonna give tony more responsibility we're gonna invite him over to lunch more now that he's not so busy with you and um have fun resting margaret you have no job like, they're on, it really seems like from the royal family's actions that they just support Tony. They don't care that he's totally wrecked the mental health of someone yeah. who's actually in the family. Like, they just don't want to take accountability for everything, anything. They just want the status quo to be the status quo. So right, even yeah. after the divorce, they're like, oh, we still hang out with Tony, of course. Whereas, like, a Fergie or a Diana, they were very much, like, out of the family. It's like, uh, we'll pay your rent, I guess but we're not going to pay your bills at Fergie and we're not going to be in the same picture or the same room as you. Yeah. It, it's almost like they're just willfully blind or willfully bliss or, you know, it, it's kind of like, oh, there's cracks in this family. There's people experience mental illness. People experience, people experience abuse. They're like, no, 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 no. That doesn't happen. There's no real world problems here. Yeah, exactly. After this terrible encounter that they have both had with the sleeping pills and the car revving incident, Margaret finally goes to the queen and says, we got to get divorced. We have to. But the queen and parliament say, no, you should just separate. Please don't get divorced because of the laws prohibiting divorce and royals. But at this time, Tony begins an affair with Lucy Lindsay Hogg Wall. Margaret is still having her fling with Roddy Llewellyn. Yeah, so it's kind of an opposite to Townsend because now she can't divorce, whereas before she couldn't marry. So it's kind of like Margaret never, (laughs) you know. Um, And two years later, in 1978, Parliament and Queen Elizabeth finally cave in. Kensington Palace announces that Tony and Margaret are divorcing. The statement says, her Royal Highness, the Princess Margaret, Countess of Snowden, and the Earl of Snowden, after two years of separation, have agreed that their marriage should formally be ended. Accordingly, Her Royal Highness will start the necessary legal proceedings. And then a few months after the divorce is finalized, Tony marries This same year, two books come out about Margaret, one by Townsend and another about how she is a tragedy. You know, even though Tony is no longer part of the family, he's still sort of in the mix with everyone. He's still commissioned to take portraits of the royals and go to lunch with the queen mom, you know, and this is kind of in contact with someone like Fergie, Sarah Ferguson, who, you know, wasn't even invited to be around Prince Philip just because he didn't really want her there <laughs> in the in the picture, you know, around breathing the, the same air. Yeah. 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 Tony was very charismatic. He he Yeah. Then after Whoa. The door in my room just opened from the wind. Tony being able to still be a part of the royal family, it kind of reminds me of this episode of Sex in the City where <laughs> Carrie wants to still be a part of her ex-boyfriend's family just because she, lo- she loves the family so much. And it's kind of this interesting thing where it's like, oh, I had a really tumultuous, I had a really tumultuous relationship. But I'll still, you know, have lunch with your mom. You know, it's kind of interesting. Which personally wouldn't fly with me. 
Yeah, me neither. <laughs> when you're out, you are out. No longer seeing my family. Yeah. The something that we did in the last episode that I want to keep as a running trend is after Peter and Margaret broke up, we went in and told the rest of Peter's story. So right now we're going to tell the rest of Tony's story. So like we already mentioned, Tony married Lucy in 1978, right on the heels of his divorce. They had a daughter together named Lady Frances Armstrong Jones in 1979. She married a guy named Rodolf Elder von Hoffmannsthal, who's the great grandson of a bunch of almost famous people and almost royal people, kind of like her, I guess. So they're a good match. Snowden is never faithful to Lucy, and during their whole marriage, he's having a 20-year-long affair with journalists named Anne Hills until she dies on New Year's Eve, 1996, when she kills herself. Ooh, tragic. Right? Finally, Lucy and Snowden separate in 2000 after the revelation that Tony has had another love child named Jasper William Oliver Cable Alexander with an editor at Country Life magazine. He also became a peer in 1961, like we had mentioned before, when he became Earl of Snowden, and he's first introduced to the House of Lords the following year in 1962. He's active in the House of Lords for a good 20-year period. When the House of Lords was restructured in 1999, all hereditary peers of first creation were allowed to stay in the House's life peers. So in 1999, he becomes Baron Armstrong Jones, and everyone freaks out because they thought that he would respectfully decline this, because why should some guy be in government based on the virtue of having married the second daughter of the king. That doesn't make any sense. He retired in 2016 after rarely ever claiming any expenses. He doesn't marry again after Lucy, and he dies in 2017 with his son David succeeding his earldom. Do we want to talk anything about Tony's life and how it ends, kind of? I don't know. What do you have to say about the rest of Tony's life? He just seems like he continues to be a scumbag and player. Yeah, it kind of seems like, I mean, I don't really know too much about, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like there was ever really an event in his life that really sort of really bothered him and kept him down. I mean, you know, he did, I think, have a tough childhood polio and um he's you know always had connections with kids who have dealt with um illnesses or disasters like an Aberfan um but in terms of like his love life and his romance and his personal relationships it kind of just seems like he just wants to have fun he wants he's always kind of chasing the next best thing um, yeah exactly he feeds off that you know energy of finding new women and making more babies even if that baby's gonna cause some drama (laughs) yo yo even if that baby's gonna uh, end your marriage yep so let's talk about life after tony for margaret so later in 1980 roddy llewellyn you know Princess Margaret's DJ, boyfriend, sling. Uh, They end their relationship. And from here on out, she doesn't really have any serious partners, but she does have men, you know, that accompany her to society events. And, you know, she'll hang out with them at parties and whatnot. Um, But it's all kind of just, I would say, casual. Um, But she does sort of, dabble more into, you know, her personal fun side in Mystique during what we call the mysterious Mystique years. Um, So after her detrimental relationships that put Margaret in between the crown and love, Margaret frequently retreats to Mystique. And if you don't know what Mystique is, it's this really ultra luxurious, very little known island run by her close friend, Lady Anne Glen Connor, who's her best friend and lady in waiting and also Anne's husband Colin Tennant third Baron Glen Connor so she would stay at her private villa Le Jolie Colin Tennant third Baron Glen Connor gifted 
Margaret this villa and it really becomes kind of her happy place where she kind of escapes the perils of being a royal and, and living in the Buckingham Palace and and also you have to remember this time um Elizabeth and Philip's children they're kind of succeeding her in terms of you know royal duties and stuff because now she's not really as much of a senior royal as she used to be so this is the same really... time like on the crown when Edward becomes a counselor of state, so they have to remove that yeah. status from her. It's like that same time period. Yeah, exactly. So she, she you knows she doesn't have as much responsibility and duty as she once did. Um, so she retreats to Mystique, where you know she will have parties, she'll sing, go to the beach, swim, wear really fun sunglasses, smoke cigarettes, drink, dance, love. Have some casual sex, party, think, reflect, and, you know, just be herself. And, um, of course, you know, even though she's casual here, people still have to address her by your royal highness. And she wouldn't let anyone get too close to her because she's a princess and she still knows that that's a part of her. Yeah, I even heard a rumor that they would have like a picnic on the beach and she'd still expect everyone to have a hat and gloves on. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like we can be casual, we can have fun, we can party, but you still have to treat me like I'm God's gift yeah. to the world. Yeah, casual but still yeah. formal at the same time. Yeah. What do you think Mystique meant to Margaret L? I think she loved it there. I think that, you know, Mystique meant having her own kingdom. She would move court there twice, three times a year to her villa. She'd have all of her friends come. She wouldn't have any royal duties. It's not like Elizabeth would be there. So, you know, she was really queen of this kingdom. So I think that that's why it was so important to her. And I bet England, I've been a couple times and it does rain a lot. So I bet being able to escape to the Caribbean twice, three times, four times a year is idyllic. For someone who lives in such a rainy hellhole. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, in her later, in her later parts of life, I can definitely see in the photographs that she seemed like she was pretty happy in Mystique um, compared to, you know, other times in England. And um, yeah, she seems like it's, it's just like she's able to be herself and to kind of you know, glow in the the Caribbean sun. Oh, yeah. She definitely mm-hmm. has a certain glow about her when she's on Mystique as opposed to photos you see of her, like, doing tours in other places. She's tan. She's happy. You can literally tell that the people around her adore her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, we're reaching the end of Margaret's story, and she's been a heavy smoker her entire adult life. She has a lung operation very dissimilar to that of her father's in 1985. She has a bout of pneumonia in 1993 and at least three strokes between 1998 and 2001. She dies at King Edward VII Hospital in London after suffering a final stroke on February 9th, 2002 with her mother, sister, and children outliving her, which I think is really sad that even her mother, who's 102 years old at this point, has outlived her fun and rebellious daughter. I think that's really sad. She's also the first royal to um, be cremated because there wasn't enough space for a full coffin in between both of her parents. Yeah, that's really sad. And and her mother did die, I think, like just a few months after, right? Yeah. uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but Dickie Arbiter, he was the press secretary to the Queen... Yeah. He's written a lot. Yeah. So Dickie Arbiter said that at Margaret's funeral, they had like all the Secret Service guards surround the Queen Mother so she could enter so she could enter the uh <laughs> church without uh the press seeing her in such a spiral condition. So he just says, Goodbye, ma'am, and it's the last time he ever saw her. He doesn't see her like from the funeral until she dies a month later. So mm-hmm. even though yeah. as a palace like courtier, you could spend your whole life like working for the queen mother. And then at the end, she just she doesn't need you. She's not yeah. calling on you to like give best wishes to because she still has that employer employee relationship with you, no matter how close. 
Yeah, definitely. So it is very tragic, I think, that she died in a very similar way to her father, you know, from lung disease, from smoking too much, and it's... Living to excess. Yeah, it's kind of living to that excess, and, and I think people who who do smoke so habitually, it's like, it's like a, it's a way to sort of find relief in a lot of moments. And I think for her, possibly it was a way to relieve stress and it kind of just became a habit and kind of a signature of her. Yeah. It like keeps her mystique and her allure intact. Like she probably smokes for very similar reasons that her father smoked because she was insecure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So even though Margaret died, it doesn't mean that her legacy has to be wrapped in pure tragedy because she's said to have a really interesting life and run-ins with some people that you may know. (laughs) Dun-dun-dun. So here are some salacious rumors about Princess Margaret. She's said to have affairs with Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones, Rock, God, actors Peter Sellers, David Niven, Warren Beatty, um, also with a couple actresses, including Anita Pallenberg, and with singer Dusty Springfield, who Dusty Springfield is really amazing. She's kind of a mix between like Dolly Parton and Nancy Sinatra. She's really, really cool. And I think her and Margaret having a one-time fling would be really interesting to you know just that's her see what song that's again. like oh son of a preacher man that's dusty's famous song oh yeah, yeah, yeah remember that actor and alleged gangster john binden claimed to have an affair with princess margaret a little fling and he boasted about how he impressed her with his favorite go-to party trick which is balancing five half pint beer glasses on his manhood, which is a little little dirty for a princess to witness. And another thing, uh, if you look at our Instagram and in one of our posts on Margaret, our Mystique post, there's a photo of her and John Binden together, even though she swears up and down. She's like, never met him. Don't know him. Straight. Mariah carrying mm. to Ariana yes. Grande hang him. Like, never met her. I don't, I don't know, know her. her. I can't speak on her. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> there's the picture of you two sitting next to each other. It's filmed, yep. so it's not doctored. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> Another salacious rumor stemming from 1979 on the heels of her divorce is that she was at a party with Jack Nicholson and his longtime girlfriend, Angelica Huston, when he's introduced to her royal highness. There's a lot of protocol that goes into meeting a royal, and he basically doesn't know what to do. He, instead of following any protocol, asks her if she wants a bump of cocaine in a bid to get to know her better. Instead, she moved through the party with consummate ease, apparently not moved by Nicholson's joke at all. She even stayed for most of the party sharing drinks and hanging out with Farrah Fawcett, Sean Connery, Robin Williams, until the early morning. Apparently, she even danced with John Travolta, who seems to have a lot of dancing royals under his belt. Yeah, that's crazy. You know... I think this story, I mean, I don't know. It just sounds so bizarre and crazy and specific to, it it kind of feels like it's true. And I also feel like I could totally see Margaret not really liking Jack Nicholson just because he, he, you know, he's a really amazing actor, you know, really renowned Oscar winning, but he's a little bit gritty and a little rough around the edges and not necessarily like someone, I mean, you would want to bring home to the queen mother, you know, like, so so it kind of seems like, this is totally on par for Margaret. (laughs) Totally. Other thoughts. What do you think of Helena Bonham Carter playing Princess Margaret on the crown? The seance? Speak to it. Yeah, so I actually really liked Helena Bonham Carter's portrayal. You know, Vanessa Kirby did a really great job, and we talked about how, you know, we love Vanessa Kirby, but... I think that Helena Bonham Carter does a really great job during the later years, kind of showing kind of that decline of Margaret. That's kind of tragic. Um, And yeah, I I think 
the yeah and and i think that helena bottom carter pursuing princess margaret through a seance with a psychic was really amazing actors um, so man. if you don't yeah so she went to a psychic and was like i want to contact princess margaret and apparently princess margaret you know was like oh well i'm glad you they picked you instead of the other person they were thinking about and she wouldn't reveal who and it's kind of you know that classic backhanded compliment that you would get from margaret which i really love classic Another thing we found is we found this list on Vogue of some of the most interesting little known facts about Margaret. So we're just going to read these off. They all sound so funny. So first, she signed her checks as Margaret. No title, no last name, just Margaret. I can't even really imagine her needing to sign a check. I would just imagine that like her private secretary had a stamp of her signature that he would just stamp on every outgoing invoice. But I guess when she needed to write checks, she just signed it Margaret. Be Margaret. (laughs) She had a very luxurious and ridiculous morning routine. Started with breakfast at 9 a.m. in the morning, followed by two hours in bed listening to the radio, reading newspapers, and chain smoking, according to Craig Brown's book, Mom Darling. Then at 12.30, it was time for a vodka pick-me-up. Third, when she was bored at dinner parties... Her and Snowden would play this game called the bread game. Every time someone would say something cliche, Margaret or Tony would rip off a piece of bread and put it in the middle of the table. And at the end of the night, they would count up whoever had thrown the most pieces of bread and that person would proverbially win. Really interesting game. And I don't, I can't see anyone playing that now, but it would be fun to try. Definitely. When we can have a dinner party. (laughs) If we can ever have a dinner party again. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So royal protocol dictated that dinner couldn't start until Princess Margaret arrived, which was often a problem because Margaret was always late, always making a grand entrance for herself. Number five, this one's Will's favorite. Margaret hated squirrels so much so that upon seeing a woman feeding them in a public park, she walked over and started hitting them with an umbrella. Just like hate squirrels and like boom, boom. Like (laughs) whack-a-mole. And this anecdote... Yeah, it comes from Lady Anglin Connor, who, as you know, is Margaret's best friend. So I, you know, it's true. If if Anne says it's true, then it's true. Must be. Margaret hates squirrels. <laughs> yeah. And her wit was legendary and often quite cruel. This is what happened when Princess Margaret met Twiggy allegedly at a dinner party, and Margaret said, "Who are you?" And Twiggy, this famous supermodel said, I'm Leslie Hornby, ma'am, but people call me Twiggy. How unfortunate, Princess Margaret retorted. It's true, because Leslie Hornby is not a celebrity name. No one is hiring Leslie Hornby. They'll hire Twiggy. They're not picking Leslie. No. Yeah. No. Twiggy later was a judge on America's Next Top Model, too. Yeah, which is how she's like an icon in our lives, too. (laughs) It's how she transcends the generations. Yep. Then on her wedding day, she wore the Paltmore tiara, which was not from the Crown's collection, but something that she actually bought herself at auction for $7,700, which is about $100,000 today. And our last little fun tip about Margaret is that she, you know, she loved to smoke and drink. We know that. But she did that so much so that she tried to combine the smoking and drinking habits by gluing matchboxes onto her tumblers so she could strike matches while drinking, which is, you know, sounds pretty effective. Skill. Right? I wish I had some skill. So to wrap her up, what is the significance of Princess Margaret? Why is she fatal? What is her legacy if she has a legacy? Yeah, I mean, I think her significance is that she was a woman who was born into this royal family and she soon found out that there were a lot of constraints that being a part of this Royal family puts on her, you know, she can't marry the person that she really loves and she can't divorce the person she hates. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, she can't, 
be her full authentic self. But I think people connect to her because she had this sort of rebellious party spirit and a little bit of a hopeless romantic element to it. And, um, you know, she's she's fun and has a good time, even though she has these really unfortunate um, events that happen to her and, you know, constraints in her life. She walks so that Diana could run, in my mind. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I don't think that she has like a super long lasting legacy because there's not like Princess Margaret Hospital. There's not Princess Margaret Museum. There's not Princess Margaret statue in the middle of Trafalgar Square. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that she is largely yeah. relegated to a footnote in her sister's story, which is sad. Because it's only been 18 years since she died. But happens to some yep. people. No matter what you do, no matter how much you stand out, you can still live in someone else's shadow. Yeah, definitely. And I think if Princess Margaret's life shows us anything, it's that life is not a fairy tale, even for princesses. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Fatal Fortunes. I have been Al. I have been Will. On Tuesdays, we talk ghosts. See you next time. See you next time. time. Make sure to follow us wherever you're listening. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, at Fatal Fortunes, at TikTok, at Fatal underscore Fortunes, and anywhere else that there is social media. Bye, guys! Bye.